government. For more on this, I was joined by the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, James Patterson. Senator, welcome. Thanks for having me, Patricia. In your own statement, you welcomed the listing of both these groups. You went on to say your committee has recommended the government consider broadening the listing to include the whole of Hezbollah. Why has that only happened now? It's a good question, Patricia. I think what's become clear in recent years is that it's increasingly hard to justify the, the artificial division that Australia and some other countries have made between the external security organisation of Hezbollah on one hand and the rest of its activities. And over the last decade, there has been a trend of countries like the United Kingdom, the United States, the European Union, Canada and others moving in the same direction as Australia has now moved to broaden that listing to cover the entire of the organisation. Uh, I think it's been clear on the evidence for some time that it is a unitary organisation, that it's run by Hassan Nasrallah, that the Shura Council oversees all of its activities, political, civilian or otherwise. Uh, but it's just become impossible, I think, in the face of that evidence for it to be ignored. And I, I welcome the government's decision. OK, but the recruiting practices of the base have been known for some time. In fact, the ABC's background briefing program reported on them earlier this year. So why has it taken until the end of November to announce this listing, as you say? We've actually known about this for some time. Why is the government delayed? Mm. Well, I welcome the government's decision to list the base as well. They are a neo-Nazi white supremacist organisation who clearly engages in planning and preparing for terrorist acts. And unfortunately, as you pointed out, there's been open source media reporting that have indicated that they've been attempting to recruit in Australia, and that's a very troubling thing. Um, a terrorist listing, though, is not something to be done lightly. It does require very careful consideration of the evidence and the law. Uh, I would not want to live in a country where ministers, uh, in response to a media report, immediately listed an organisation as a terrorist group. They have to go through many different steps, including getting assessment from an intelligence organisation, getting an assessment from the Australian government solicitor as to whether or not the legal threshold is met. And then it's something that's often considered and debated uh, in the National Security Committee of Cabinet. And a lot of whole other um, countervailing uh, issues are considered as to whether to uh, make that decision. So it is a very involved process. It should be an involved process because it immediately criminalises membership of those organisations and attaches significant child terms for it, so it shouldn't be done lightly. You say they are both actively recruiting here. In light of that, why hasn't this listing been made more swift and what difference will it make in practice? Well, it makes two important differences. One is it sends a very strong message about where Australia stands and how we view organisations like this. And that does have a disincentive for people to get involved in these organisations. Most ordinary people, even those with extreme views, don't want to participate in terrorist organisations. Some of them, though, do want to do that. And for those people, it attaches very serious criminal penalties, including jail terms, simply for being a member of or supporting those organisations. And that's as it should be. It gives our uh, law enforcement authority the powers that they need to take the action that's necessary to protect Australians. This announcement follows a series of, at times, violent protests in capital cities over vaccine mandates and pandemic legislation. Is the committee looking at the status of any other groups as a result of these violent scenes uh, that we've seen, particularly in Melbourne? The way that terrorist listings work in our system is that the minister makes a decision to list them and then the committee reviews that decision and makes a recommendation to the parliament whether it should be upheld. So it is up to government to instigate it and then for us to review it. But having said that, parallel to this, we are running an open-ended policy inquiry into extremism and radicalism in Australia, looking at all forms of it. And we have been particularly troubled by the way in which the pre-existing trends of online radicalisation in particular appear to have accelerated uh, during COVID. And there's probably a range of factors that have contributed to that. One is people's isolation from their normal communities and networks that um, means that the normal disruption to that radicalisation pathway isn't happening. Uh, for some groups, uh, the COVID pandemic and particularly the public health response to it validates their conspiracy theories in their mind. Um, they think it's the evidence of the conspiracy that they always thought was out there. And so it is. it is, has been a, a disruptive and unhelpful trend in that regard and we are looking at it closely and we'll bring down a report that will make a range of recommendations to government. Your committee has also recommended the entirety of Hamas be, lift, be listed as a terrorist organisation. Has there been any movement on that? 
That's a more recent recommendation, uh, much more recent than the Hezbollah recommendation, and I'm uh, hopeful that the government will consider it on the same basis that it did the Hezbollah uh, recommendation for the same reasons, because uh, there is there is no uh, meaningful distinction between the political and uh, terrorist wings of Hamas. It is a terrorist organisation, and there are a number of criteria for listing a terrorist organisation in Australia. One of them is that they're involved in incitement of terrorist activity. So even if you didn't believe that Hamas was involved in organising terrorists, which I think is clear, but even if you weren't, just the public statements alone by the so-called civilian or political leaders of Hamas, where they incite and instruct their followers to engage in specific acts of violence against Jewish people in particular, um, I think easily meets that threshold. So I'm hopeful the government will respond positively as they have done with Hezbollah. Just moving on to some other issues before I let you go. Senator Jared Rennick is claiming the reduction of the claim threshold for the no-fault COVID-19 claims scheme as a win. He continues to withhold his vote over concern with vaccine mandates. Uh, was that changed to secure his vote and how damaging is this to the government? My understanding, Patricia, is that that issue was already under active consideration by government and, in fact, I believe it had already been to the Expenditure Review Committee of Cabinet, so a decision on that was imminent in any case. Um, but nonetheless, I welcome Jared Rennick stepping back from his threat to not vote with the government on procedural matters. Uh, that is a bare minimum that we should expect of a member, a Liberal uh, senator, uh, a member of the government, that you should vote with your colleagues on procedural matters. Uh, and I would argue if you have a difference of view from the government on a policy issue, that that difference of opinion should be confined to that policy issue and shouldn't be uh, something which is exercised over all legislation and the government's entire legislative program because the effect of doing that is you're basically handing over the control of the government's agenda to the crossbench and the Labor Party and it means that anything which is contentious with either of those groups can't proceed in the meantime and I think that's a very regrettable thing. The Religious Discrimination Bill has also been released. It gives Australians of faith who make statements of belief extra protection from existing state-based discrimination laws and allows religious institutions to give preference to the employment of people uh, from the same faith. I know some of the moderates in your party are concerned, particularly over that statement of um, faith, that uh, it can ultimately lead in the sort of discrimination of people in minority groups. Is that a, a risk here and should it be modified? I really welcome where the government has landed on the Religious Discrimination Act. I think Michaelia Cash has done an excellent job of consulting across not just our party room but across stakeholders with very divergent views and there's no question that this is a compromise bill and that there will be some things in there that some people don't like and there'll be other things that are not in there that others would have liked to be included but I think this is a good pathway forward. On the statements of belief provisions in particular I strongly support it. I think it's probably the most important provision in the bill because intrinsic to the right of religious liberty is a right to speak freely and to hear others on the question of religious matters. And it's really important to understand that this is not just a protection for religious people. I'm agnostic, I, I don't have religious faith, but my right to criticise religious beliefs is also protected by this provision. It will mean that if genuinely and in good faith, and if I'm not harassing or intimidating or vilifying anyone, I can call into question religious beliefs and say that I don't believe in them and I earn the same protection under this legislation from those state anti-discrimination uh, acts as any religious person does to talk about their faith and I think that's a really important step forward. The government's Senate inquiry into the ABC and SBS has been suspended after a narrow vote in the Senate. Was there really any need for the Senate inquiry when the ABC has already announced an independent review? Well, the Parliament often does things at the same time that executive agencies of government or independent agencies of government do because we have a different perspective and a different role. The ABC's inquiry, as I understand it, is an internal review by the ABC for the ABC and the Senate has a different role. We represent uh, the, the people of our states and we act on behalf of taxpayers and it's entirely legitimate for taxpayers to have a say through their elected representatives on the way in which a wholly taxpayer funded yeah. entity chooses to a, administer itself. Bit of an own goal though by the government wasn't it? I mean the, the failure to sort of consult across the parliament to even try and achieve bipartisanship I mean it's not going forward because it looks like it was perhaps mishandled. 
Well, it, it, it could have gone forward, in fact, had uh, Joe Rennick voted with the government on that. It would have, uh, that committee would have proceeded and been allowed to conduct its inquiry. Unfortunately, I think uh, the Labor Party and the Greens in particular see the ABC as a partisan issue. They think that there's political advantage to be seen as a defender of the ABC. And they think any scrutiny, including legitimate scrutiny like this, should be fought against on political grounds. Uh, and I think that's a shame. I think it's, it's a bad precedent that the chair of the ABC, Ms Buttrose, has publicly called for a political intervention intervention by the Senate, and the Senate has done that. I think uh, Labor and Green senators will regret in the future if another agency of government doesn't want the scrutiny of the Senate and calls for the Senate to cancel it. Um, they won't have much to defend themselves on. They won't have anything to fall back on if they do so. Isn't it her job, though, to fiercely defend the independence of the ABC? Uh, you know, she's obviously publicly voiced her concerns about interference. I think she's erred on that very question of independence. I think it's not independent to call for political action by political parties in the Senate to exempt well, the no, ABC she from it, legitimate no, scrutiny. She called on I, the I government not to do this. Well, that was actually uh, my, a my memory of, of the, the phrase of words is she called on the Senate to vote in that way because it was clear that the government supported the inquiry. And I don't think that's an appropriate thing for an impartial, uh, apolitical, independent, nonpartisan head of the, of the ABC board to do. The Prime Minister said that uh, Australians trust ITA. Uh, that was actually his own language when he appointed her. She was appointed by, as you know, your government, Scott Morrison. Mm. Uh, if you look at her long career, uh, that's the case, isn't it? People do trust her judgment. Oh, there's no question, Patricia. Ida Buttrose is an eminent Australian who's achieved great things in her life. But I think in this instance, she has erred. I think it was inappropriate to call for the Senate to cancel a Senate inquiry because it's entirely legitimate for the Senate to inquire into the expenditure of public money. That's what the Senate does. That's what its committee system is for. And whether it was the ABC or any other arm of government, any other taxpayer funded arm, I would think it would be inappropriate for them to call on the Senate to cancel a review into themselves. I think that's wrong. Senator Patterson, just finally, the Chinese government has called for certain people to stop the malicious hyping and politicisation of the issue of that tennis star Peng Shui as mm. the international community continues to express concerns about her well-being. Firstly, how concerned are you about her well-being and what's your response to the Chinese government's um, warnings around this? I was very disturbed by these reports, Patricia. Uh, it does appear to be a very concerning report on its face value and I would like it to see that it be independently investigated and that her safety and welfare be guaranteed. Unfortunately, I don't think we can rely on that within the Chinese political system. The Chinese justice system is highly politicised and it serves the ends of the Chinese Communist Party, not necessarily of the Chinese people, and the rule of law is not robustly and consistently upheld. So I'm, I really welcome the way in which the international tennis community in particular has been so outspoken in support of her. Um, she deserves that support and uh, I'd like to see the Chinese government uh, deliver on that open, transparent inquiry and, and investigation if necessary. Senator Patterson, thank you. Thank you.